morning, everyone. Welcome. And Genesis is the producer of the show. Um, unusual circumstances. Uh, every year we have two tours, actual tours of our facility. Usually we rent out a bus and we get about 100 of our closest neighbors and we drive around the facility. But things are a little bit different now. And so today, in replace, instead of those um, actual tour, we've tried to put together a virtual tour of our Pointe Hills facility. So welcome, and like Genesis said, um, if you have a question, we want to make this interactive, just like if you're on that bus driving around the landfill, raise your hand, put it in the chat, we'll try to answer it in real time. So thank you for joining us. Okay, I'm okay. Thank you for joining us. Um, so we serve 5.6 million people. We're at the sanitation districts of Los Angeles County. Um, we serve 5.6 million people um, as far north as Lancaster and Palmdale. And our mission, our mission is to protect public health and environment through um, cost effective and innovative wastewater and solid waste management. Our agency was formed in 1923. Um, and the big issue in back in 1923 was there was raw sewage along the coastline, in particular South Bay cities like Manhattan Beach, Redondo Beach. And these are the three men that helped form the sanitation districts. In the middle was the chairperson of the Board of Supervisors, LA County Board of Supervisors at that time. On the left, it was the state assembly member who wrote the legislation that created the sanitation district and moved it through to its passage. And on the right was our first chief engineer, Albert Kendall Warren. So we were created to handle wastewater. We did such a great job. We now manage about 400 million gallons of sewage every day with 11 wastewater treatment plants. Um, and you can see in the shaded areas, all the sanitation district service here. And, and we serve about 78 of the 88 cities in LA County. And each of these sanitation districts has their own separate board of directors with local control of the mayor or the county board of supervisor. But we did such a great job when the next big environmental issue hit LA County, we were called uh, to step up. And post, so we addressed the wastewater issue. During World War II, a lot of people moved to LA because of the war effort, helped in building tanks and planes and the like. So our population grew. And when our population grew, we also had more solid waste to dispose of. And what people did back then was just take it to the back of their yard and burn it. I mean, you're looking at a backyard incinerator on the left, and that's a pretty fancy one. Some people just put it in drums and burn it. And so LA got the reputation of smogville from backyard incinerators to car and so on. And so LA County Board of Supervisors commissioned the study and realize, okay, one of the low hanging fruits that to address the smog problem is to ban backyard incinerators. So they started amending the Sanitation District Act that created our uh, agency, so we can also handle solid waste. And the final amendments went in place in 1957. Um, uh, one of the final amendments is that we, we don't collect trash, we only manage it when people bring it to us. So after the act was amended and backyard incinerators were banned in 1957, we got into the solid waste business. We opened our first, first landfill in 1957, the Palos Verdes landfill that you see down here, it's now closed. And we quickly picked up five landfills. And we grew and we did such a good job that we now currently manage a fourth of LA County's trash. Today, we're gonna to be looking at the Pointe Hills facility, which is the cornerstone of our solid waste management facilities um, in terms of, you know, it handles the bulk of the trash that we manage. We're gonna look at Pointe Hills in particular, the material recovery facility. This facility uh, opened in 2005, and that's where we take about 2,600 tons of refuse coming in, and we try to recycle as much as possible. And we're trying to make this virtual. All right, and we're also gonna look at the closed landfill that the material recovery facility sits on. It still generates power, it still generates energy for us. 
and also the neighbors use it for hiking and horseback riding and so on. Um, we also have a recycle center, a recycle buyback center at the site. So you could bring your cans and bottles and it's a California, California recycle buyback center. Are there any questions at this point, Genesis? Yeah, I think we had one question, but they lowered their hand. Okay, all right, thank so. you. All right, so let's go for a drive. If you're in main office, this is the view you would see driving towards Point of Hills landfill. Um, and we have to thank Genesis for taking all this video. And I want to play it again. So you leave our office. I did not run a red light. And that mountain you see in front of, it, of you is Point of Hills landfill. That represents 130 million tons of trash. Um, it, it's the equivalent of a 50 story building. One of the things we're most proud of is people drive by on the 605 um, and the 60 freeway every day and they don't notice the landfill. We've sculpted a mountain out of trash and we've vegetated it. And so it's, it's a great neighbor. This is how it started. It started as a little dump, my attempt at humor. It started as the San Gabriel Valley dump. And, um, and it was in this area, if you can see my curse, my uh, mouth, uh, that it started. But what's great about this picture, it's not a great quality, but there was no 60 freeway. What you see here is the San Gabriel River. There's a local road, but there's no 60 freeway. And look how there are no homes. So, so it started in 1957, privately owned uh, landfill. We purchased in 1970. Look at all the homes. You also see the interchanges of the freeway. And so we purchased over and we turned it into a modern metropolitan landfill. We basically pioneered the modern landfill design. And um, I'm sorry, I love technical drawings. I'll hopefully we'll step through this quickly. Um, when trash comes into this land, came into this landfill and any of our landfills that we still operate, it comes in in this lower level, we compact it and then we cover it with either dirt or in the old days, green waste to make sure we stop the spread of disease. And as we cover it, we bury um, pipelines and gas wells and trenches in there so we can pull out that gas that's being created in there. So when you see an anaerobic environment, it's an environment without oxygen and those microorganisms eat that organic material and they generate methane, CO2. Um, and we, we initially were burning it, but we'll show you how we generate power off it. Is there a question, Genesis? Yeah, we have a question from Lucinda. Hi, Lucinda. Uh, ask you to unmute yourself, Lucinda. Yes, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you great. Um, I'm wondering if you've done a coring down into that anaerobic layer to see, uh, to see what's going on uh, currently. Um, historically, yeah, we have you know, a number of, uh, we've worked at a number of universities that we used to be in our solid waste research group. So uh, I, I don't know, recently we've always kind of kept track of what's in there and there have been some papers written on it. Because the waste stream is inconsistent, some areas have more moisture than less, we've had like landfill archaeologists dig into the landfill and find newspapers completely intact from you know, 1958, while in other areas, you'll see a lot of decomposition. So the waste stream isn't consistent. It's, it's pretty varied. So we know that we have a lot of anaerobic digestion going on, but then there are areas where you might have not a lot of moisture, you might have a lot of concrete debris. So you might not have, it won't settle or it won't decompose as much. Hopefully that answers your question. Is there another question, Genesis? Uh, there's a question about Athens uh, that picks up their trash and recyclables and um, in both the same container. So they want to know how does that affect the recovery facilities work? So Athens is a private hauler, private company. And so we're, you know, a special agency, a special government. Um, and so anyone can bring trash to it. So if it's a blue bin container, it helps, uh, it's easier to recycle from that. If it's that general bin into, uh, container, it just makes it a little bit more problematic, but we, again, we try to recycle from that. So we take whatever comes to our door, 
in terms of municipal solid waste, we take it. And so depending on the hauler for your various city, they may come there depending on, you know, it's, it's convenient and it's the right price point. Oh, and Bob. I think Bob has again, our solid waste management department head wants to say, add something. You might want to unmute him because he knows. Yeah. Morning, Bob. Morning. So Athens, like you mentioned, is a private waste hauler and they have, we're not the only entity out there operating solid waste facilities. So they have their own materials recovery facility that processes their black bin and separates out recyclables. So um, most of Athens stuff goes to their own materials recovery facility. But we're the best, right, Bob? Absolutely, of course. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. All right. Awesome. And then we have one more question from Jorge before we before we move along, Jorge would like to know, with settling, are there any landslides on the property? No, and, um, and Bob probably knows better than I, but we have some parts of the landfill that can settle as much as 100 feet. Um, and so you can manage it, you do really great things with it. But that's why it's not a good idea to put structures, buildings on a landfill. You use it for passive uses, parks, golf courses, you know, so there's, so we don't, it's engineered, it's designed. So we don't have landslides and it's compacted. All right, and can I move on? Yeah. No more questions in any place on the bus, right? No. Okay. All right. Um, and you know, any, any virtual program has to have a sponsor. And today's virtual tour is sponsored by our Household Hazardous Waste Collection event. And so Genesis will give a free plug, but this is really important. Let me go back to the previous slide. I kind of forget. One of the things we do in a modern landfill is that we put a liner down, what you see here. So what we did, we'll do at Point of Hills, before we put the trash down, we put a liner down to collect any type of uh, moisture that may percolate in through the, the, the refuse. So let's say someone didn't properly dispose of paint or uh, some kind of thinner, and it's in the refuse and it rains on the refuse, that rain will pick up some of that material and it could percolate down into our groundwater. So we've put in a liner system to capture that moisture material, that moisture, and then take it to our landfill for treatment. So I mean, to our wastewater treatment plant for treatment. But one of the things we found out long time ago, back in the late 80s, it was very cost effective to have these free household hazardous waste roundup where people could bring their paints, and Genesis can tell you more about it, any of those items and we'll take it, we'll recycle as much as we can, and it's just more cost effective than having to do cleanup or control in the environment. So go ahead with your plug for your HHW. No. Well, actually, really quick, someone brought up a, a good question uh, about the lining of the landfill. Alejandro would like to know if there's any risk of the liner deteriorating over time. Um, the liner is, is, is really kind of sang, uh, sandwich. Um, you, you first put down the synthetic material, there's a collection drainage system, and then there's a synthetic liner on it. And so uh, um, a synthetic layer on top of it, and then the trash goes out. But like everything else we, we do at the sanitation district, we have to have checks on it. So we also monitor groundwater condition in that area. And so let's say, you know, that one in a million or billion chance that the liner has a tear in it, we might see something in the groundwater monitoring. So we're pretty confident in the liner, but like everything else in your car or your plane, you want to have checks. And so our monitoring system, we have monitoring system of our groundwater around our landfill. We also monitor the ambient air. We also monitor the what's in the landfill gas. So we're always checking our work. And I think, Bob, did you want to add something? Yes, unmute Bob. Yeah, just that the, so the, the design of the liners is very tightly controlled by um, the state, the Regional Water Quality Control Board. Um, and so there's a huge amount of regulations on how they're designed, what materials you can use, and as they're constructed, as the materials are fabricated, they're tested, and then as they're installed in the, in the ground, we have to hire a third party to inspect every inch of every weld of the liner. So 
it's a very rigorous test testing that and we submit that testing process to the regional board and then they they have to give their the regional water quality control board and then they give their approval before you can put one ounce of trash on top of the liner so it's very rigorous uh way to check the that the the liner is constructed the way it's supposed to be bob are you decent could we show your video or you want to be we would love to have you this is what happens on our bus tours usually we have a special guest and we make them part of the tour so you're like the the, the, the uninvited bus tour guest that we love more like the gadfly <laughs> can we uh, can, can we see your video would you like to be a panelist well, i'm okay i'm okay we'd love to see all right all right okay thank you bob so, uh, keep bob unmuted <laughs> all right yeah so back to uh so now back to my my hhw plug uh, we do have collection events going on mainly every weekend. Um, next Saturday, we'll be having events at La Puente, La Habra Heights. It's very quick and easy. Most importantly, it's a free way to dispose of all the household hazardous waste items that you have in your home, whether it's paints, uh, fluorescent light tubes, electronics that you might have, like TV, cell phones, uh, sharps. So please feel free to check out the, our website at www.lacsd.org slash HHW. We have La Puente coming up, but we also have events in Baldwin Park, Arcadia, Santa Clarita, uh, Carson, et cetera. So please Guess feel free to check loves out. this program. And so does Bob too. All right, let's move on. Yeah. So as we continue driving on the trash, and what you're looking at is the interior landfill. You, there are hiking trails, there are horseback riding trails. We have a nursery or landscaping crew that is vegetated as the landfill as we built it layer by layer up. And here's a little taste of driving through the landfill. Yeah, so it's pretty lush. It's pretty beautiful there. And you wouldn't think that you're driving on top of a landfill, which is what's so great about it. Pardon? Was that a question? I said it doesn't even seem like you're driving on top of a landfill, which is part of what makes it so great. Yeah. The only way, the one thing you will notice is that the road may uh, go up and down because you have differential settling through the landfill. So the maintenance crew has to keep kind of smoothing out the road, but it's, it's a great open space. And as you drive through the landfill, you'll notice these pipelines. Remember I talked about the trenches, um, gas collection wells. These are part of the gas collection system. It's the, the gas that's being created anaerobically by the microorganisms are collected under vacuum and they go through this pipeline and all these pipelines that you see through this beautiful lush um, habitat are all going to our power plant. And so all gas, all landfill gas, which is about, uh, which is mainly methane and CO2, carbon dioxide, goes to our Point of Hills Energy Recovery Facility, or PERG, as we love to call it. You know, in the initial days, that gas was burned. What you see here are flares. So basically the landfill gas would be brought there. And this is like the world's biggest Bunsen burner, if you remember from your chemistry lab and it's burning this gas, collecting it, burning it, destroying it, so we're protecting the environment. But Bob and his crew a number of years ago said, you know what, that's the same methane in our stove, natural gas. So PERG is basically a power plant. Most of that gas, most of the time, goes to these, um, these facilities that burn the methane, heat water, create steam, and generate electricity. This plant on average, generates about 30 megawatts of electricity. Um, and we use that power to run our facility and anything that's extra, we sell into the grid uh, to bring our operation costs down and just to be just, you know, great stewards of the environment and being fiscally uh, frugal. So now once you leave PERG, you go to the very top of the landfill.
I hope that's coming across really well on Zoom. Um, it's pretty neat. Um, and let, let's do this again. Let's see if I can do this again. Um, wait. So this is the panoramic view that you see in the landfill. This is the, it's at about 500 feet off the ground, the top deck. It's the equivalent of a 50 story building. The landfill sits on about 1,365 acres. Um, we've only filled about 600 of that acre. The rest is buffer, buffer property. Um, it's open for hiking, horseback trial, uh, trails, um, just for preserving native habitat. Um, and we've also, um, for every ton of, uh, for every ton of refuse we collected since 1993 uh, till the landfill closed in 2013, we collected a dollar to help create the Point of Hills Native Habitat Authority, which I'll talk more about. And if Bob wants to add anything, because he's the real expert on this, I'm just a good looking face. That was a joke. So here's the top of the landfill. Um, you, back in this area, as you look out um, behind you, there's a watering hole for your horses or picnic benches. It's just really beautiful. And the landfill closed in October uh, of 2013. And I'm sorry, Bob. This is Bob right here. We, we were hoping Bob would show up. This is Bob, and it's not Bob saying, hey, that's the last truck going to the landfill. That's Bob showing the folks um, where the landfill, if the landfill height or the final layer or the top of the landfill is down where the, the pointer is at, um, it's about a 117 acre top layer. We were hoping to build the top of the landfill all to where Bob and these folks are standing. But because of the great recession in 2008, our tonnage, just landfill used to see 3,200 tons of trash a day. And in 2007, 2008, the tonnage precipitately dropped. And we didn't know what it was. And then we realized it was the recession. So that meant that the rate that we had calculated to fill up the landfill was a bit off, like everybody else in the economy. No one saw the recession coming. But we had committed to close in 2013. So we only used, we, we've only used like 92 or 93% of the capacity of the landfill which is equivalent of 130 million tons that are buried there. And we, have, we probably could, could have buried another 12 million tons of, of refuse there, um, but we had committed to closing in 2013. Any questions on that? Any raised hands? Nope. Okay. Well, we got you anyway, Bob. <laughs> Let's move on. Okay. Um, so with the closed landfill, it, it continues with our tradition. We have a tradition of transforming landfills into points of pride in the community. Early on, I talked about the Palos Verdes landfill down in South Bay. Well, that opened, that was our first landfill. It opened in 57 and closed in 1980. It's now, a part of it is now home to the South Coast Botanic Garden. So it's probably the first botanical garden in the world that's on a closed landfill. And so you might have been there for a wedding. You can go there for a walk. It's open. Uh, you know, you have to call ahead, but it's open. And you can see a most beautiful botanic garden in South Coast Botanic Garden. Um, our closed Spodra landfill. We have a relationship with Cal Poly Pomona where we created, we help fund Lamb Lab. There are dormitories there. There's the farm store. If you live in that area, you can go to the farm store, which is an amazing place to purchase produce grown there or brought in, as well as there's different studies and agricultural stuff going on there. Um, and it's just a beautiful partnership. And so we're hoping um, to continue that tradition. Um, I mentioned, this is Point of Hills Landfill. Uh, we helped create the Point of Hills Landfill Habitat Authority for a dollar for each ton from 1993 to 2013. We helped fund the creation of this Habitat Authority. We donated about 200 acre, 220 acres of land. So that Habitat Authority manages about 4,000 acres between Point Hills Landfill and Going East. And it creates an incredible wildlife corridor for the, 
the native habitat there, and also there's a number of hiking trails and so on that, you, that are, are open to this day. And you can go to their website and just and take advantage of this really great open space land. And we hope, you know, and for Point of Hills itself, we, we, could, we hope to work with Parks and Rec and create the same kind of beautiful open space habitat in that community. Uh, there's a raised hand, I think, Genesis. Oh, you're good. Okay, all right. All right, so since the landfill cl closed, where does it go? It goes to the star of this whole solid waste management now, the Pointe Hills Material Recovery Facility, or MER. You're looking at the facility here from high on up. It opened in 2005. It sits on a, uh, a footprint of about 25 acres of land. The building itself is about 2,000. 2,500 2, uh, square feet. It's one of the coolest recovery, rec materials recovery facility and it's fully enclosed. Let's see what we get here. This is driving down from the top. This is the view you would see and you see the Point of Hills material recovery facility um, uh, here. So what happens to your collective ways? If you live in Southgate or Pasadena or wherever, if your hauler decides they're gonna to come to a landfill, you drive up to one of the scales and when the landfill was open, um, you would see a similar scale like this and you pay cash or credit, you get weighed, you get paid, you, you, you charge by your tonnage. And then you drive inside. To the left, bailed up recycled material. And notice the building. You have the, the, the lighting coming in from outside to minimize our lighting needs or energy needs. We use recycled material in building this facility. Um, yeah, it, it's, a, it's, it's a really environmentally forward thinking building. Um, and as you go in, you see the trash in different locations. And notice this mezzanine right here. So if we were on the actual bus tour, we would have gotten out, walked in the building, and walked through this mezzanine and see what's going on. And here's the view from the mezzanine. You see that all the activity going on. And one thing I want to point out, what you see coming from the ceiling is moisture, mist. So there are even sensors in there. If it may be getting too dusty, the sensors will come on and just have uh, dust control with these misters in the facility. We have, uh, we have a question. How many trash trucks do you receive a day? We are handling about 2,600 tons of trash per day in this facility. And Bob is probably, sorry to put you on the spot, I would, I'm gonna guess, but Bob probably knows it precisely. He's just that kind of guy. I would think, uh, I don't even wanna guess how much 2000, Bob, would you have an answer to that? I, I'm gonna guess like 500, but let's say Bob. You know, I don't do math very well in my head anymore. Okay. Maybe in my younger days, but. So it varies depending on the tonnage and say the average weight of one of the bigger trucks is five to seven tons and the average weight of some of the smaller ones is, you know, a, a one or two tons. So it really, the number of trucks depends on, you know, big trucks coming in, small trucks and daily fluctuations. So it varies. Bob, anything you'd want to say about your newest facilities, this material recovery facility, anything you want to add? I, I'm assuming you're going to talk about the food waste. Yes, we, we will. All right. No, All right. Go ahead. you're doing a great job, Basil. It's everything I learned from you, Bob. All right. Oh, well, one other thing, someone wanted to talk about the $1 per ton of the okay. money collected that also went to the neighboring community. Okay, go ahead. That was a question. Uh, what was the, I didn't hear, what was the question? Actually, um, Someone asked, can you talk about the $1 per ton of the money collected that went, that also went to the neighboring community, Hacienda and Avocado Heights? Um, I'm familiar with $1 ton that helped create the Point of Hills native habitat. I think there were some funds to help the lighting and that's where Bob may, that may be, beyond, I'm not as familiar with that. Um, Bob, would you have anything to add to that? Sorry to put you on the spot. 
There was money that went to the local supervisorial districts to uh, help out in the neighboring, but that I, I don't have much more detail on that at this point. Yeah, I need to do I. But yeah, we just try to, to give back to that community. Thank you. Any other questions, Genesis? Uh, we have one from Randy Black. Was the $1 per ton for the Point of Hills Landfill Habitat Authority separate from the tipping fees contributed to mitigate effects of the landfill held by LA County? Yeah, so in addition to fees, that, um, um, on, in, on the tipping fee, a dollar out of that tipping fee would go towards the Habitat Authority. So. Okay, perfect, we can move on. So, so the refuse comes in, it's unloaded, big trucks, smaller loads, hand loads. So if you're a do-it-yourself type or you want to knock, cut down a tree in your backyard, you can call ahead um, and come in, pay your fee. And we're, we separate the big trucks from the small trucks, you know, just like in nature or your fish tank. Um, we try to recycle as much as we can. Yard waste that's come in is composted off-site. Wood waste is used to generate electricity. We try to uh, combust it to get burn, generate electricity. So we're trying to reuse, if, if we can think of a use for it, we're gonna put it to it. And that's what Bob and his crew do. They think of like, hey, why can't you use this for that? And then we have the recyclable piled up and then we, we, we try to we sort that, we bale that. We bale it, um, these are bales that we typically, we, we try to get revenue from to bring our costs down. Um, you're looking at some of our latest machine. We'll talk a little bit about that, a new automated sorting line. But most of our recycle, uh, recyclables in, in California, in Los Angeles, and in the whole country, most of it is going overseas. Most of it, they've been going, going to China. But it, they've been toughening their standards because they felt that the recycled material coming in wasn't pure enough. It wasn't clean enough. So it really, they started rejecting their loads or making or turning ships back. And so it's led to a huge reduction in um, the stuff um, exported, recycled material. You can see kind of, you know, the, the change in the pie chart. And so a lot of stuff that isn't being recycled, you know, we're trying to recycle or find new markets in other countries, but if it's not being recycled, it's being landfilled. And for the, what isn't being landfill at the MERP, we, we reload it into uh, transfer trucks and we take it to the landfills. We have arrangements uh, with Orange County where we take it there. We have, long, we have arrangements with them where we take the, the trash that can't be recycled and, we, and it's, very, it's managed in their landfill. The Bob and his crew, the solid waste management crew, and Genesis and I, we're just trying to tell their story, but they're always, it's a competitive feel and they're always having to come up with new ways. So they've installed in January an automated sorting line that is about four times faster. It has computer, um, it, artificial intelligence. And so <clears throat> it can pick, the tr pick through the trash cleaner and Bob, I'm putting you on the spot because you know a lot more about this than I do. Uh, but it basically speeds up our throughput, and it's cleaner, and hopefully it'll help us pr pr produce recyclable that will be more, that can go into these markets. Bob, please help me here. Are you there, Bob? Oh. <laughs> Someone yeah. asked. Yeah, so it basically tripled or quadrupled the sorting speed from, you know, 10 to 12 tons an hour on our previous one to four to 30, 30 to 40 tons an hour, depending on what it is that it's sorting and uses, um, you know, a, a bunch of different uh, technologies kind of in sequence to uh, separate, you know, first pull out the oversized material and then the fines and then separate things by density and size. And is it, a two-dimensional thing or a three-dimensional, two-dimensional being like paper versus three-dimensional, meaning things like containers, you know, aluminum cans, et cetera. And then it goes through, you know, so it goes through these various processes. And then once we kind of have, have it 
then it goes through a uh, optical sorting. So where it automatically a, a, a machine will will be able to identify the type of material it is and separate it out by you shooting basically blasting it off the belt with a with a blast of air to and then separate it out again and then we do one last look at it to make sure it's pure and then bail it up and you know we're testing out a robot that will help us in that final quality control check to that's this artificial intelligence thing you're talking about is on yep. a robot that's you know cleaning up plastic to make sure it's the right purity yeah and then the robot is a recluse we have to go there at the right time of day to see the robot in action or we would have brought the, the video of the robot in action thank you bob so Bob and his crew are finding new and innovative way to make sure we generate clean recyclables. We also have, so, you know, we're here to support our member cities and the folks out there. California has a very high recycling goals. So despite the kind of setbacks in the market and even COVID, um, we, we still have these recycling goals to meet. And one of the things that one of our engineers realized that in LA County, every day we throw out about 4,000 tons of food waste. That food waste, if it isn't managed properly in a non-sanitation district's landfill, it could lead to greenhouse gases because methane is a, is a greenhouse gas itself. And if it's released in the atmosphere, it's 23 times more disruptive than carbon dioxide. So they came up, Bob and, his, and a solid waste management group, all the men and women, develop one of the groundbreaking food waste recycling program. It starts with source separated food waste, and we have a short video. And that, let's just go through it. Please play. Hopefully you're seeing it at your hand. So this sort, this food waste goes into what's called a DOTA system. You see this hopper here? And it's just, they're wearing masks, but it's still pre-COVID, and it's facility still running. So you can see the mixture of food waste and the plastic bags in there. And we're just taking a small fraction of that 4,000 tons. It goes into that system, flips a switch called the DOTA system, D-O-D-A, and they're not a sponsor of this virtual talk. And so it's ripping the bags apart, separating the bags and plastic from the onions, the carrots, the tomato. Um, and when this bio, these rejects, that's just a fancy word for the stuff that won't break down organically, plastic and so on. It does it twice. It wants to make sure we get just the pure food waste. And these are all plastic, finer plastics coming out. And this stuff gets landfill. And Bob, I may put you on the spot again. If, if, you, any, if you want to add anything, Bob, come in. Into, this is what we want. This is the food waste slurry, our favorite smoothie. And I wish you could take the bus tour. It does have a little smell to me. Um, so this, go this ahead, is basically just a big, it's, think of it as a giant blender where you're putting stuff in the hopper and then it gets fed into these two blenders that rip it apart and smash it into small pieces and the plastic comes out one end and the apples and pineapples and watermelons and everything else get turned into basically a slurry and fall out the bottom as, a, as this thick kind of oatmeal consistent like a loose oatmeal kind of consistency. Bob, do you have a feel for how much tonnage you're taking now at, in terms of food waste? So are, are you going to talk about the joint plant project? Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about that as well. Well, whenever you feel it's a appropriate time to bring it in. So I'll, right. talk, I'll point out these tanks and then we'll go to a joint plant. So this is where the slurry is, is, is stored before it's tanked off to our joint plant, Carson. And I want to show this smaller tank. That's a water tank. So as Bob talked about the blender, so you're mixing the food waste with water to create the slurry of the, the right consistency in these tanks. Then it's tanked over to our largest treatment plant. 
down in Carson. And one of the things that makes us uniquely positioned, we have a wastewater side and a solid waste side. So the solid waste side at material recovery facility, you're creating this blender type stuff. And then we have this wastewater treatment plant where you can put it in there and using that same anaerobic digestion process that occurs in the belly of the landfill, it also occurs in what we call digesters and that generates methane. Then that power, just like the landfill, we harvest that, we run it, we use it to run our facility and sell the extra and grid. You can see some of the microorganisms in these digesters. We have about 24 digesters at the joint plant in Carson. That was our first treatment plant. And we basically mix the food waste with the wastewater solids that have been settled out. And it goes into these digesters for about 18 to 19 days. And it generates power at our total energy plant where we, um, we take that methane, it's a 20 megawatt power plant. It basically runs the, um, the remember I talked about PERG generating power for us. This runs, uh, generates power to run our largest wastewater treatment plant. And so we're basically energy self-sufficient. With the food waste, we're gonna bump up our methane production, energy production. So we're gonna use either the energy produced for more electricity, we'll sell it at, we have a compressed natural gas fueling station on the campus or next to our large treatment plant that people can come up and fill up their buses or taxi or car. And then as we generate more gas, we could in theory inject it into local uh, natural gas pipeline. You know, we, we could, you know, we could generate up to, I don't know, 11,000, the equivalent of 11,000 gallons per day of gasoline with our food waste at full build out. But Bob, if you want to add anything at this point before I transition away from food waste. Yeah, just that in August, so in, we're currently constructing for the first phase of this additional gas. So right now, there's, in terms of the, the overall amount of food waste being generated or being recycled in the county is relatively low due to a number of different challenges, including kind of the whole COVID situation, the lack of infrastructure around the county to, and, and funding for various facilities. So we're doing our part with our infrastructure that we have, and it's kind of a regional solution that a lot of entities, not just the districts are gonna be involved in, but for the first phase of our energy recovery project at the joint plant, we're in the final stages of constructing a, a cleanup system to take that, the biogas, the, the methane that's generated from the digesters there is about, the, that, that gas is about 60, 62% methane. And we're going to uh, increase it up to 90% methane. We're gonna purify it. So we're in the final stages of constructing that purifier. And then it's gonna go into and actually feed that, the, the CNG, the compressed natural gas station. Okay. And we're gonna run our own vehicles on it. And there'll be, you know, currently buses and trucks and passenger vehicles use that station as well from the surrounding area. So um, in August, we should have that system up and running. Fantastic, pretty exciting. So bring it on, all source separated food waste, we want it. That means, yeah, because even the source separated stuff, you can see all the plastics in there. All right, so we're one of the biggest producers of green energy, this segues into it. You know, between, um, the, this is PERG in the middle, about 28 megawatts, our wastewater treatment plants, 20 megawatts, that's the joint plant in Carson we just looked at. And then we also um, burn refuse, generate about 30 megawatts. And so we generate about 70 megawatts of electricity or energy. We only need about 23 and the rest we sell back into the grid at a huge um, saving for our rate payers um, by bringing our cost up. There seems to be a raised hand from Caesar and Genesis. Yeah, Caesar, would you like to ask your question? If you could unmute yourself. Sí. Uh, okay, so what do you, what happens when all landfills uh, close or shut down eventually in the next 20, 30 years? 
So, um, you know, Bob and his crew are thinking of ways of recycling. We see ourselves as um, converting waste into resources. So you saw the food waste that we're trying to do. You saw the automated sorting line that they put in. But everybody needs to have a backup plan. And as an engineer, Bob is a very risk averse engineer. So what we've had, let's see if we have a slide on that. We don't, um, and I'll probably go back to, so we've built, um, um, we have a remote landfill called Mesquite Regional Landfill. Because people have asked that question starting back in the 80s, in the 1980s. Um, and Genesis, even though she's on, she's a great historian on it. Our, the Board of Supervisors, a lot of people back in like the 80s had the same question. What happens when all this landfill closed? Sanitation districts, you were the option when we banned uh, backyard incinerator. You still need to be the safety net if someone needs or there's a need for large scale land skilling, uh, landfilling or these landfills closed. So a number of years we implemented a waste by rail system. So the material recovery facility is the first step in this waste by rail system. Whatever, we try to recycle as much as we can, but whatever can't be recycled now is going to Orange County. But let's say all those landfills go away. We can go from that facility through a tunnel next to it. And one of the aerial shots showed it. And we, we have our own intermodal yard um, and we're, we're leasing that out to make some revenue. But in the, if we needed to, we could flip that over. The trucks could go to that intermodal yard we would load it up on the train track and it would go out to the Mesquite Regional Landfill. That landfill, and Bob is the expert, I'm just, like I said, I, I'm just talking about their story. It has about 100 years of capacity. It can handle up to 20,000 tons per day. Point of Hills, that when it was open, was the largest landfill in the nation, and it was about 13,200. Mesquite Regional Landfill, about 200 miles east of here, or east of here, um, I'm not in Whittier where our office is, so 200 miles east of Whittier um, could handle a hundred, uh, hundred, uh, handle trash for a hundred years. And it's built exactly, or a newer version of what you see at Point of Hills system, uh, well, gas collection system, the likes. I don't know, Bob, is there anything I missed? And no is a fine answer, but is there, would you want to add anything? Yeah, I just want to emphasize that, you know, we're, we're recycling as much as we can with the state laws out there, right, that are now targeting organics, right? So there's, we're get, there's recycle programs now starting for a number of different portions of the waste stream, but you know, that there's, um, I, I don't think that we're ever going to get to a point where there's zero residual waste. And so, yeah, what you said about having to be a backstop and, and needing capacity at some point, you know, to provide long-term disposal capacity is still a need. While the amount of waste may be less as, well, will be less as recycling increases, right? That there's just, you know, there'll always be something that needs to be thrown out hopefully a lot less, but you know, that, and that something needs to be um, responsibly managed and we need to plan for that. Well said, Bob. I think that kind of, that's a perfect wrap up. Um, we look forward to welcoming you again to our facility. That's the, the shot you saw from the mezzanine. If, you know, we usually had uh, tours with school kids or the members of the public. Um, that is a, a view from the mezzanine, and we look forward to when the world gets back to a little bit more normal, having you in the mezzanine and Bob and the men and women solid waste facility. Um, with that, I uh, just want to thank you, and Genesis, Bob, and I will be here to take your question. So, Bob, unmute yourself. Any questions, Genesis? So, we have um, one question. Two questions. What, first one, would it help if customers sorted their own food waste? That's a Bob question. Um, it, that, that, it depends on the, the individual city that they live in, um, what their food waste program is like. Right now, the regulations are kind of more focused on the commercial sector, 
So restaurants and uh, um, grocery stores and food manufacturing facilities and any, any place that has cafeterias, et cetera, has to have a program that separates out their organics. And I imagine eventually that'll come to being enforced on a local level, at a residential level where, where individual homes and uh, apartment complexes, et cetera, would have their source separated or, you know, uh, food waste separated. So it really just depends on how it's implemented in your own city. So the cities are tracking, you know, what they need to do and, and working with their haulers to develop the most cost-effective solutions for organic management that fits the needs of those local jurisdictions. So I can't say one size doesn't fit all. What works for one community might not work for another, and it really has to be kind of developed on a city-by-city -city basis on how, how to implement that program. You know, some, some cities are going to collecting the green waste with the food, food waste mixed in with it, so it just really depends on, on the needs and, and how the individual cities uh, are gonna implement their programs. Okay. Great, so our next question is, uh, does the sanitation districts, do the sanitation districts have a plan for disaster waste management, like materials left over after a potential natural disaster, buildings, bridges, et cetera? Uh, this is Bob's question. I'll start it off, but Bob um, will finish it. So when the when the Woolsey fire occurred, there was a lot more debris. So um, I guess Bob worked with the county to increase the tonnage limit there. So there was a lot of debris that came into our Calabasas landfill. But, you know, it, God forbid something like that, mesquite is always there. That can take 20 million, uh, 20, 20,000 tons of trash per day. So we... That, like Bob said, and I said, it's a backstop. So if there was, you know, something like that, um, where you had to get rid of a lot of debris very quickly, we're positioned to take care of it. We could take care of it. I don't know. I don't know how long it would take Bob to take the seal off that and have it up and running. And um, Chuck so, wants to add. Wait, Bob's go ahead. No, go ahead. No, you go Chuck, ahead. Chuck I thought wants you said to add something. Oh, Chuck wants to add something. Okay. Yeah, the uh, County of LA developed a disaster debris management plan that we participated in. So there is an overall plan if a major disaster like a big earthquake were to occur, how the collection and where the various locations would be to process the material and dispose of it. Okay. That's what I was gonna add. Great, thank you. Um, so our next question, I love, uh, from Patty, it says, uh, do you think you will hold a virtual trip like this for students during the school year? Oh, we've already do it. You guys are, I shouldn't use the word guinea pig, but you're, the, you know, usually we have Saturday tours for the public. You guys are the first Saturday tour for the public, but we've been testing out virtual tours for school kids. Um, so yes, most definitely. We have, how many tours, actual tours do we used to do a year before for school kids, Genesis? I don't know. We used to do over a hundred. And so all that's been suspended and we're trying to, the school kids still need this information and knowledge. And so we, we've been developing these virtual tours and we've done a number of them and we're trying to perfect it. So yes. So if you're a teacher or you know a teacher, that you think would be very interested in a virtual tour like this, please contact us um, at our email up above and we'll get something scheduled for you as soon as possible. And we also have virtual tours of our wastewater treatment facility. Don't, don't ever forget about our wastewater treatment facility. It was the first and original function of our agency. So. Great, and so our next question is, uh, are there any active landfills still operating in our area? Um, we have we have two Shoal Canyon and Calabasas, but Bob is the one will, who can he 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 can just name check them. That's his life. So there's a there's a number of landfills operating within the county, 
and outside the county that are within a uh, reasonable trucking distance. So yeah, there, there's, there's a number of different landfills operated mostly by uh, private entities, but also some public entities like Orange County. So there is, you know, a, a good number of landfills out there um, that have a, you know, a significant amount of life left in them. Great, and next question, is there anyone, is there any place that recycles plastic bags anymore? Grocery stores are no longer taking back the bags. That's a bad question. So, um, like Basil mentioned earlier in his presentation, right? So the, the, we export a significant, not just, not just LA County, or not just the state of California, but the whole country, and actually significant amounts of the world export uh, their recycle or a good amount of their recyclable materials to various countries, including China and others. And China, he mentioned, um, started clamping down on, you know, they wanted to decrease contamination in their own country. And um, that's really changed kind of the dynamics of what can be recycled because, <clears throat> so one is they're not accepting plastic bags. A lot of other countries are not. And, um, you know, with the kind of the cost of natural gas has dropped and that's lowered the price of a lot of other things. And so it's just not economically feasible to use pla recycled plastic bags at this point and at this location. There might be other parts of the country. I'm not that, I'm not familiar with that, but I'm not aware of actual markets for plastic bags that we have access to here. Thank you, Bob. Okay. And uh, our next question is, are these facilities that were covered in the presentation standard across the state or country in regards to automation and sophistication? Um, Bob can pick up more, but I think the, the automation is pretty cutting edge. Um, I think it's there. I wouldn't say it's the standard because, you know, there's recycle operations in, you know, rural counties that have population of 20,000 to, you know, large metropolitan areas like us and and their programs are tailored to their needs, how, how, what they can afford, how much throughput they have to have, what they can recycle and what markets are available to them. You know, the markets that are available to us here being uh, with access to ports might not be the same in rural Idaho, say. So it, it just depends, but that's kind of the, the way that the industry is going, especially with you know the, the the purity standards that we need to meet and the cost of labor going up, really has pushed us to doing more automation. And um, I would say that's the that's the general nature of how things are going is bigger facilities so that you have this volume to um, help mitigate the cost of of um, having all this new expensive equipment in it. So I would say the kind of in general, larger facilities and more automation. But it's certainly not every, not everybody is doing that. Thank you. Next question, what is the biggest thing that residential customers can do to make the sanitation processes better? Oh, I, I Bob? You're, I'll jump in. So the biggest thing that you can do is be aware of, so every, every hauler that, that collects waste, right, takes it to various different facilities. Some take it to us, some take it to their own facilities, but their processes are built around, you know, what they, what their machinery is and what they can do with the end markets. And so all of the haulers, all the cities are gonna have some sort of public outreach via the, on the web, they're, the, either the city or their haulers will have 
a list of items that are supposed to go in the blue can, right? They should, you should take that to heart, right? So just the fact, so what we see a lot is people that put things in the recycle bin that they think are reusable, like, oh, I have a pair of tennis shoes that don't fit me anymore. Well, someone could reuse those, so I'm gonna put them in the recycle bin. Sure. Well, when they go to the recycle facility, they're not set up to do tennis shoes, right? They're set up to do paper and cardboard and aluminum cans and things like that. So any, or, you know, things like that, that get, that might be reusable, they don't belong in the blue can. They, they can be donated if it, right? But they shouldn't be put in the blue can. And we see a, a lots of contamination of that, that type where it just, it's not, we're not set up to be a secondhand store or a materials recovery facility. So garden hoses and the like, things like that can actually damage our equipment. So I would suggest going, contacting your hauler, contacting your city, finding out what belongs there and sticking with that. And I'll, I'll also use this opportunity to plug our household hazardous waste collection events again. Um, none of your household hazardous waste items should go in any of the bins. Please take them to one of our free collection events throughout the county. And uh, someone had asked me for the, for the website. I put it on the chat box, but it's www.lacsd.org slash HHW. A lot of events throughout LA County and it's all free. Thank you for that plug, Genesis. <laughs> Yes. So the next, you guys ready for the next questions? Yes. It, um, what is the next big thing as far as tech that you will take to the next level? Automated trucks, operations, IoT sensors? Wow, again, Bob, I'm <laughs> glad you showed up. I would say <laughs> food waste and the automated sorting line. Um, what's the, the next big thing, Bob? Um, I think the, the next big thing really is how to, and we're working on that, it's how to effectively manage organics, right? It's, it's what, what is the most suitable technology for us to get the biggest bang for the buck for the, the gas that we generate from the organics. So that's, that's, that's the thing that we're, you know, most, working on at this point is how what's the best way to maximize uh that that process how to how to get the most gas and how to what's the most uh economic way to uh re to put that to a good use great and for our next question basil you won the bet he he knew there'd be a question about this would it be cost efficient to run the waste by rail once LACSD landfills close? Would it be cost efficient? Yeah, to run waste by rail. I think Bob said it, I said it. Uh, since our entry into the solid waste business, there are many private companies and entities that do solid waste management, but we've been tasked to always create or be a safety net. And that's what we're doing. Someone, one of the earlier questions talked about, you know, if there was a major um, disaster, would we have enough landfilling? Yes, we would have it. And so there, it, you know, it's like when you get an airplane, you need to have redundant systems. And so that mesquite landfill is part of our safety net. Yeah, at some point, like I mentioned earlier, there's a, a fair amount of capacity that that's been permitted uh, within LA County and in surrounding counties that are uh, accessible, economically accessible via transfer trucks, you know, but that capacity is not infinite. So, you know, when that kind of, I'll call it local or re regional capacity is gone, then we're gonna to have to go further afield. Okay, and I think uh, those are all of our questions.
Do we have, oh wait, hold on, I spoke too soon. Um, let's see. The North Whittier neighborhoods are separating their trash into black, blue, and green bins faithfully, but when the trash haulers come, they dump all three bins, everything into the same truck. Why? Bob? So, um, without knowing the, the specifics of who their hauler is, but what I, what I can say is that, um, you know, what, what we experienced at our facilities kind of during the initial kind of as COVID really became a, a big thing, more and more people were getting hit with it. The hospitals were reaching capacities, et cetera, that we temporarily suspended our recycling operations to protect the workers primarily, right? Because of the close proximity that they had to work in and the nature of the work, which is touching waste materials. And, you know, at the time there was less certainty in, in terms of what the transmission mechanisms were, et cetera, on that. So we made a decision that until we knew more and could institute more processes to protect the workers, that we temporarily suspended our operations for two months. And it wasn't just us. There was a number, I would say probably half of the facilities serving the region did the same thing for the same reasons. So during that time period, and I'll, I think it was a couple months. Mm -hmm. So during that time period, as one, more information came out, and two, we uh, instituted some processes to provide more physical separation that recyclables were being thrown out. And it was most cost efficient for the haulers to commingle everything together at that point because it was all going to track to being thrown out at, at that point. Now some some haulers continue to do recycling and some but a lot of them commingled their recyclables and their trash, but it's just for that short period. I'm not aware of anybody that where that's a continuing process. We reopened in May and uh, I believe shortly thereafter, most or all the haulers that serve that that feed material to us reverted back to, um, you know, separately collecting it and 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 we would do the recycling. So that that was kind of the the my under I would imagine without knowing the the particular hauler that you that serves your area, that that was the reason and it was a short-term thing and it was to protect the workers until we figured out what, what was happening and how we could best protect the, the, the workers. All right, thank you, Bob. Jesus, uh, are there any more questions? Okay, great. Um, uh, I said thank you for an honest answer. So, Another one, Germany has five bin cans that they use to separate their trash in residential areas. They have enforcers that fine householders for not sorting their trash. Do you feel that we need to implement such laws? What laws do you feel need to be implemented in the near future that will decrease less waste in the recycling process? Uh, we, are, we, we try to process what's brought to our door and I think Echoing kind of like what Bob said, it's up to each city to decide what is the right fit for them. And then as an agency, we try to figure out um, the best way we can make ourselves useful. Um, I know that's what I would say. I don't know if Bob as the head of our solid waste department would want to add anything else. No, that's, that's the answer. It's okay. a I got you right. <laughs> Thank you. That was a joke again, Bob. So I think those are all our questions. Um, one last thing before our social media specialist kills me. We do have, we're on um, Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, we're on YouTube where we post a lot of uh, educational content and we'll be posting a lot more in the future. But mainly if you're interested in when our next public tour is going to be, we have, I think we have one for San Jose Creek coming up. Uh, I think. We have uh, joint we have plan August 1st. Same time. The joint plant. So if you want more information about that, 
please, please, please make sure you follow us on Facebook or like us on Twitter or Instagram. We'll try to keep everyone up to date there as far as our, our next public tours and just educational tips and what we're up to throughout, throughout the days. Okay, so. with that, if there are no more questions, I just wanted to thank Bob. This is, you know, this is the first time we've done it, but it's the same kind of dynamics. A lot of times on our bus tour, we have a surprise guest, and today we have the head of our solid waste management department. Thank you, Bob. Hey, I did want to mention also, thank you for doing this, but also that you mentioned that I did this and I did that. I, you know, I, I just have a bunch of really dedicated and smart people that work for me, and they do the work. So it's them that do it. it I'm just making facilitating it. They're the ones figuring out all this stuff. So I just want to give kudos to them. Yeah, yeah. It, they're, yeah, great men and women there. So thank you, Bob, for um, participating this morning. Thank you, Genesis. Thank you, folks, for joining us. And the one last thing is you see the email address for Genesis and I. We'd love to get your feedback to how to make this better, this experience better for you, more informative for you. So Give us a rating from one to 10, 10 being metaphysical perfection, add a line or two how, what we could do better or so on. And just enjoy the rest of your um, weekend and be safe and uh, see you around. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you.